This fall, C-SPAN debuted a new series, Books That Shaped America. Ten books that have provoked thought, won awards, led to significant public policy changes, and are still talked about today. In this episode, Tom Cronin talks about his book, Imagining a Great Republic, which is a survey of 40 American novelists from Harriet Beecher Stowe to Hunter Thompson. This episode first aired in 2018. Tom Cronin, your new book, Imagining a Great Republic, you say All the King's Men is the best political novel ever. Why? It's, a, it's the best American political novel. And uh, he, first, it's beautifully written. Uh, he's one of the great craftsmen who wrote about politics. Um, you could add in a few people like Steinbeck and others, too. But uh, Warren is, is one of, it was a gifted writer. Uh, it's important because he captures the paradox of politics and power, that politics is, is inevitable and necessary, and power, you have to have power to make things happen and to bring about change. But he also talks how power can be a toxic uh, and can be intoxicating for somebody who wields it, and power shapes the power wielder. And the case of Governor Willie Stark, loosely based on Huey Long, it, uh, it captures that story. But most importantly, that book is important because it's about moral responsibility. And uh, half the book is about Governor Stark's aide, Jack Burden, who uh, gets, who's from the oligarchy, he's from the privileged class, he's highly educated, he's a former reporter, and he gets sucked in and he becomes um, the bag man and, and the dirt collector and um, he does horrible things and rationalizes, rationalizes that even a flawed person uh, doing, doing some good things is okay to work with. And only very late in the, in the novel does he come to understand kind of a, a moral awakening about uh, good and bad. And, and nobody in American literature has captured that as well as Robert Penn Warren, which is why it won the Pulitzer Prize and why he is uh, generally revered as the best American political novelist we've produced. How many books did you read to write this book? Oh, I had to read probably 100, 150 novels uh, to select down to 40 or 50 novels that I treated. Uh, tough decisions, Scarlet Letter, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, um, Faulkner, um, and in many cases, which Steinbeck book to use. Um, in the middle of my writing this book, Harper Lee came out with a second book, and I decided to give it almost equal treatment um, because I think her second book actually talks more about politics than her first book, even though it's not, as, not, not a literary success. A um, lot of great books that I had to say no to. I want to go way back to, to the 60s. You came to this town as a White House fellow what were you doing at the time, and what impact did the White House Fellowship have on your career? That's a good question. I first came actually in 1963 as an intern for a Republican senator from Massachusetts, a fellow named uh, that only people our age will know, <laughs> Leverett Saltonstall was his name. He was a three-term governor, three-term uh, U.S. senator from Massachusetts. He's a wonderful man, and I was an intern for a lengthy summer for him in 63. He came back in 1966 as a White House fellow working in the White House West Wing with Bill Moyers and Douglas Cater. Um, that was a fantastic opportunity. I was a graduate student at Stanford University. I was studying public opinion polls and voting analyses and city governments and so on, and all of a sudden I was thrown into what I jokingly call the original LBJ School of Politics. And I, I learned enormously. That program and similar programs like the Congressional Fellow Program and the Supreme Court Fellowship Program, uh, invaluable at encouraging people to think differently and ask fresher questions about how democracy works. One of the great novels that I treat in Imagining a Great Republic is Henry Adams's book, Democracy, an American Novel, written in the 18, uh, 1880s, early 1880s. It was written anonymously because he was so well known, he feared he'd get lawsuits from people. But his protagonist is a woman, Madeline Lee, and she comes to Washington and she, uh, not a, as a White House fellow, but she comes and lives across from the White House. She's wealthy and a, a widow, and she uh, 
she gets to know senators and gets to know operations, and she asks major questions. Uh, is this constitutional democracy, is this American political experiment going to work? And she read the congressional record, and she would go to hearings, and she would interview everybody. And, and in a way, the, all these fellowship programs for people in their 20s are similar to that. It, it, asks, it, it really puts you into the situation of seeing political leaders in action, seeing their flaws, and seeing the ambiguities that they have to live with. One of the great novels, by the way, in American political life is Alan Drury's Advice and Consent. Nobody does a better job of dealing with the, 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 the ambiguities that U.S. senators have to deal with. And it's, uh, if Robert Penn Warren's novel is the, probably the best American political novel, Alan Drury's uh, novel, Advice and Consent, very long, um, only about two weeks about a, about a nomination hearing is what it's all about is the best book on Congress, best novel on Congress. And I dare, dare say you can learn more about U.S. Senate from that book than you can from a hundred political science and history books. Because you call it the best political novel in America, American politics, let's look at uh, Robert Penn Warren, see what he sounds and looks like, and tell us more about him. A man comes to power, a Hitler, a Stalin, uh, any man of, of, of power, because he feels some need and uh, preys on some weakness of people in his context. They need him. People get what they deserve in the way of government. It's, it's their weakness or their uh, debility or their uh, vice that brings a man to his role. Did you ever meet him? I never met him, but I admire him. He was a true Southerner, and he was a, a student at Vanderbilt, top in his class. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He uh, went to the University of California, Berkeley, he studied at Oxford, and uh, was a longtime professor. He taught for 10 years at LSU, uh, right around the time that Huey Long was dying. He met Huey Long only once. And he responded that he was both terribly impressed and also very skeptical about the uh, overbearingness and narcissism in Huey Long. Huey Long at that time was running for president. And, uh, but he had done a huge amount to make LSU a serious research university. Um, later, Robert Penn Warren wins two, no, two additional Pulitzer Prizes for poetry. Most people, most people who know his All the King's Men uh, episodes don't know that he was a literary critic and a poet for most of his life and in the field of English he's known for that and uh, another footnote is that he didn't really feel all the King's men was about politics he really felt it was about human nature and uh, and as I talk about in my book it's a it's really a book about Morrow's responsibility and the urgency in the political sphere to have people be aware of and conscious of their moral responsibilities. Before we started, you said you saw a lot of the movies that came from the novels and yes. then had to read the novel. Explain more about that. Well, my task was to look at, uh, at, at, at uh, political fiction. And as I said, I wind up writing about 50 novelists and all their novels. And uh, it was confusing in about 10 cases there are some superb Hollywood films, uh, like on Gone with the Wind and Grapes of Wrath and To Kill a Mockingbird and Manchurian Candidate, just to take a few. And uh, uh, my, I felt my obligation was to the written novel, but the fact is that uh, many people, more people, have seen the movies than have read the novel. So I, I felt obliged to read the novel at least twice and interview the novel, but also to see the film if I had not already seen it and, um, and, and there's some interesting observations. Uh, the most famous line in Gone with the Wind has Rhett Butler saying, uh, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn uh, in the movie, but in the novel, it, the frankly isn't there. And it's an often quoted line, but it's quoted not from the book, but from the movie. Uh, Steinbeck's messages in Gr Grapes of Wrath are toned down, I think, uh, for 
um, for the movie, although he admired the movie. But so you have nuances that are different. Uh, I encourage people to watch the movies and read the novel. Let's uh, show a clip from uh, the uh, All the King's Men, as you say, about Huey Long. Who was who was he? He was a, a governor of Louisiana and then a U.S. senator from Louisiana. But the, uh, he's mostly known because he was a, a rural representative, self-designated as a as a redneck, uh, and that he would be the representative of the Hicks taking on the ol oligarchy, meaning the oil and lumber and cotton industries of that state. And uh, he was going to be a change agent. And uh, yes, let's watch it. And he was assassinated. He was assassinated in 1935. And what about in the novel? In uh, the no novel, he gets assassinated uh, at the end of the novel. And uh, yeah, it's a famous he, actor plays the part in All the King's Men, Broderick Crawford. Let's, let's watch. He, and he won the, uh, I'm sure he won the Oscar that year as well as the movie did. It's a great movie. There's a second movie that I don't recommend, a second version. Later. Okay, let's watch this clip. Yeah, you're Hicks too, and they fooled you a thousand times just like they fooled me. But this time I'm gonna fool somebody. I'm gonna stay in this race. I'm on my own and I'm out for blood. Now listen to me, you Hicks. Listen to me and lift up your eyes and look at God's blessed and unfly blown truth. And this is the truth. You're a hick. And nobody ever helped a hick but a hick himself. All right, listen to me, listen to me. I'm the hick they were gonna use to split the hick folk. But I'm standing right here now on my hind legs. Even a dog can learn to do that. Are you standing on your hind legs? Have you learned to do that much yet? Here it is. Here it is, you hicks. Nail up anybody who stands in your way. Nail up Joe Harrison. Nail up McMurphy. And if they don't deliver, give me the hammer and I'll do it myself. That's a great clip, Brian. And uh, it shows populism, uh, an agent of populism at work, rallying people to a cause. His cause was just. The state of Louisiana had a, a, a it was ruled by the 2 percent, and it was an oligarchy, pure and simple. And uh, it was a time for change, and he was feeding off that. And uh, psychologists talk about there are some people who are, cro who are chronic followers or uh, chronically in need to follow somebody of an authoritarian, a populist bent and in true in all cultures. I think um, <clears throat> Warren himself mentioned that Hitler's come along and uh, Stark's come along. Robert Penn Warren was agonized in this novel between celebrating the need for policy and political change and worrying about how power can corrupt and how power can intoxicate those who have power. And he, he, he kind of favored Stark, the governor, but not Starkism, if I can uh, invent that term. He also worried, said we should be worried about Burdenism, which is his right-hand man, Jack Burden, who became corrupted by being swelled up in the vortex of power. So <clears throat> power is needed to bring about change, but power is a, uh, can be a toxic uh, uh, burden, if you will. And uh, so it's a, sorry for the pun, but his book is a stark warning about uh, the paradoxes and contradictions of power. Where have you spent most of your teaching life? I, mostly at Colorado College. I have been blessed to be associated with Colorado College since 1979. I was a White House fellow and taught at a few universities elsewhere, like University of North Carolina, and um, worked at the Brookings Institution for two or three years, which was a great early experience for myself. <coughs> I also, I took 12 years off to be a college president at a small liberal arts college called Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, a delightful school a small liberal arts college in a small town, and I, I, I love that experience. Um, being a college president at a small college is, a, is still being a teacher in a way. You're teaching teachers and alumni and students all at the same time, and um, my wife and I have very strong uh, ties to that town and that college. And But I've been associated with Colorado College, a liberal arts college in Colorado Springs uh, for most of the past four decades. Which of your books has sold the best? Well, I had the good fortune uh, as a young man to be associated with James McGregor Burns, 
and Jack Peltison, who are, who are co-authors of the leading American government textbook. And I joined in as a third author, and for 30 years, uh, and eventually becoming the managing partner of the number one uh, best-selling textbook in American government. And we had a spin-off on state and local politics as well. So those I actually sold a million, two million copies or whatever when I was involved in them. I also wrote a book called The State of the Presidency that was widely used in presidency courses. A co-author and I, uh, Michael Genovese and I, wrote a book called Leadership Matters a few years ago that won the best leadership book award uh, I think for, for the year 2013. So I've, lo I've loved writing about elections. I wrote a book on direct democracy that Harvard University Press published. And um, so I've done a lot of textbooks, but the, this new book I have is a, a new venture for me and it goes beyond political science and it's a combination of literature and politics and I'm hoping it encourages more strongly a field of American polylit, um, which is to how can we learn about the American political experiment through the eyes of, of our storytellers, the national storytellers. And uh, some people would be surprised, but we have dozens of first-rate storytellers Joe Heller and Toni Morrison and uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe changed the nation. Many of these books change individuals. I have met young people who say, I'm a, I'm a public defender because I read Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, or I'm a pov I'm a, I work in poverty law because I read John Steinbeck when I was a high school student. Um, the uh, filmmaker who's famous for the Civil War series, uh, um, Ken Burns. Ken Burns says Michael Shara's Killer Angels changed his life. He read that and he wanted to write, do a documentary. Was well, there a novel that changed your life? Um, I don't know that that's the case, but uh, collectively, all these novels are are altering my thinking. And uh, uh, when you do a second or third reading of Grapes of Wrath, it's a powerfully spiritual book. And although it's a real tough critique about the American economic system, wow, does it, it show you what humanity is all about and that we need to help one another, we need to have structures that uh, are there for one another. And the Jode family story of moving from Oklahoma to Southern California was a, a tragic story where um, uh, they were exploited and scammed and so on. Upton Sinclair's story about the jungle, a similar story. Many of these novelists are essentially saying, and I'm learning it again and again as I reread these books, we can do better. The American political experiment, the American idea of equal justice under the law and freedom and equality and opportunity uh, is, is powerful. Let's look at John Steinbeck, who won the Nobel Prize. This is back in 1962. Grapes of Wrath is what you're talking about here. Let's watch this a bit. Literature was not promulgated by a pale, emasculated critical priesthood singing their litanies in empty churches. Nor is it a game for the cloistered elect, the tin-horned mendicants of low-calorie despair. Literature is as old as speech. It grew out of human need for it, and it has not changed except to become more needed. What was he like, do you know? I never met Steinbeck. I met his oldest sister when I was a graduate student at Stanford. She uh, she hosted me for a tea in Monterey, California. Steinbeck uh, went to Stanford, never graduated, and he came from a Republican family in a Republican town of Salinas, Kansas. But uh, while he was a teenager or a young adult, there was a crushing of a, a lettuce workers union in his town and he was embarrassed by that and he became interested in the plight of migrants. He wrote for 10 years without having any success but then he found his voice when he went home to Salinas and Monterey and San Jose. So you're talking about Salinas, California, you yeah. said Kansas. I just oh, want to make, yeah. Oh, I meant Salinas, uh, California. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Steinbeck uh, wrote so many awesome books. He, he was radical in some of his early books in Dubious Battle, which is about a communist organizing thing. Uh, but his books like Mice and, of Mice and Men and Cannery Row and East of Eden, powerful, powerful contributions to American literature. And uh, 
he, he had a writing ability that uh, I, I think if you do a quick reading of Grapes of Wrath, you don't really profit from it as much as going back and rereading it, maybe watching the film in between and uh, going back to it. But it's powerful in terms of its spirituality. Um, it was thought by some people to be a kind of track for socialism. Eleanor Roosevelt, quite rightly, immediately after she read it here in Washington, D.C., she said it's a profoundly urgent, spiritual, and, and, uh, and, and pro-American pro book. And on that note, I'd like to quote Bono, the U2 Irish singer. He recently had an album in which he has a, 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 a one song called The American Soul. And in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine recently too, he, he said, the Irish people are wonderful people. France and Great Britain are great countries. But, uh, but they're not an idea. America, he says, is an idea. And uh, he says, that's why we've become obnoxious and, and boisterous about when you don't succeed. The rest of the world, Bono is saying, and he's speaking, I think, for a lot of people worldwide, um, the whole world wants the American idea to succeed. It, it is a special, unprecedented, aspirational uh, and, uh, collection of aspirations from Jefferson and Lincoln and the founders. And what I found in Brian in writing uh, Imagining a Great Republic is that the American idea and the American aspirations are constantly present even when an author is upset with America. If it's Upton Sinclair or Sinclair Lewis or Philip Roth or Ray Bradbury or, or um, Richard Condon, Manchurian candidate, they may be critical of paranoia or our failings or Harry Peter Stowe, Tony Morrison, tough on our ancestry of slavery. But in all of them, there's a no notion of redemption, that this country stands for something higher and we can do better. And so Bono is right. Amer there is an American idea and it's worth fighting for. It's worth writing about. It's worth making documentaries and movies about. And it's... Uh, it, 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 I think a reading of major American political classics uh, is, is very ennobling and empowering in terms of this country stands for something very special and the great writers like Stowe and Harper Lee and all these people are, are reminding. They're, they're, they're storytellers saying our tribe wants to be something special. Uh, not just a city on a hill, but a, a city that... Uh, cares and loves one another and is willing to work with one another and understand that politics is indispensable to our bringing about progress for as much people as possible. When did you start this? Oh, three or four years ago. Uh, Where were you when you started it? I was at Colorado College and I was, uh, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my professional teaching career and so I didn't have the uh, the necessity to meet peer standards and I could read and write and assign things. So I began, to, I taught for a couple of years a course called the American Political Novel. And, uh, and that reading together with students was powerful. Mortimer Adler, who you may have met when you were younger, had a wonderful phrase, reading alone is almost as bad as drinking alone. <laughs> and uh, I love that phrase. And that's true. Uh, you need to read books like this with other people in order to get feedback. I learned enormously from students who'd write a paper on some of these novels or who would sit down and, and have tea with me and chat about how, uh, Richard Wright, The Native Son, which, are, which is a very brutal, stark treatment um, of racism in Chicago. Uh, so it took two or three years of reading. It was a delight, absolute delight to read these books. How and hard was it for you to get a publisher? <clears throat> Uh, I asked some of my regular publishers, like Harvard and Oxford, uh, and they they were polite in turning it down. Uh, it, was, it was hard, I, but uh, this publisher and a couple others were quite interested, <coughs> and this publisher actually produced it within six or seven months. It, uh, it, it done a nice job. I want to show on the screen you. I think I counted about 41 novels that you list yes. that just so people can see. Oh yes, the, you know a lot of the different names. We'll put just put them up there, and then we'll pick a couple as as you look at it. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe, Upton Sinclair. You've named a lot of these: Sinclair Lewis, John Steinbeck, Richard Wright, Ayn Rand, 
Edward Abbey and uh, Philip Roth. And let's go to the next group here. It's hard for me to even see at this age. Mark, Mark, Twain. Mark Twain, of course, is one of our most famous writers, but this is not uh, anywhere near his most famous book, The Gilded Age, but it gave that name to that post-Civil War period. Uh, we now all regularly refer to the, the Gilded Age as the post-Civil War period. Uh, Fletcher Knabel and Charles Bailey, I want to down here with Seven Days in May. Tell us about that and what impact that had on uh, the well, country. Well, you and I, I met Chuck Bailey when we were around the White House in the 19th. Uh, he was a reporter. He was a reporter. Yeah. Chuck Bailey was a tall fellow yeah. and uh, had a distinguished heritage from New England. Um, that's a great novel. And one of my students pointed it out to me. So that's, you sh that's a really book about military, civil relation. C civilian control of the military, and both the book and the movie, by the way, are quite good. And uh, <clears throat> it's a very, very it's written by two veteran reporters in Washington D.C. in the early part of the John F. Kennedy presidency, and it gives us both in the novel and the film the most believable American president in American literature. Uh, so I recommend even that alone. But also military coups occur regularly in Latin America and Africa and other nations. Um, and it could happen here. And they're one of the few teams or few author um, examples that, that crystallizes a uh, possibility that a coup could occur. And within seven days, which is where uh, comes in the title, the president and his staff were able to unravel and prevent the coup from occurring. This, well, the year of this was it's 1962 uh, published. Uh, let's go to the next list because there's so much for people to know okay. that's in this book. One of the ones I wanted to ask you about in there is Joseph Heller's Catch-22. What's that mean? Catch-22. Catch-22. Actually, the original title was Catch-18, but another novel came out that year with 22 in it, and the publisher, Random House, I think, or whatever, <laughs> to switch it to Catch-22. It's now in the dictionaries, and we hear people invoking Catch-22 who have never read the book. It's, it's fascinating. There, there are certain uh, mentoring candidates, another word that's in the American lexicon, without people having read the book. Uh, Catch-22 refers to the fact that you, 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 two things simultaneously are asked of you, and it's not impossible to do them both. And Joe Heller was a bombardier in World War II in uh, an island off of Italy, and he uh, uh, this per the book is largely autobiographic, but it's in novel form. He tells of a mindless uh, superiors asking of his crew and of him to do things that are implausible or wrong or being done just for bureaucratic purposes or for their, 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 the promotion of the, the colonel in charge. And uh, Heller's is a profound story about uh, Dilbertism, if you will, and organizational bureaucracy where the bureaucracy becomes overwhelming in terms of its own needs and self-interest rather than the individuals and the soul of people who work in them. Joe Heller had no compunction of serving in World War II. He felt it was a just war, but he uh, that book becomes kind of an anti-bureaucracy, anti-war book historically because of uh, uh, this, the tales he tells. Here's a clip from the 1970 movie uh, Catch-22. Is Lark crazy? Of course he is. He has to be crazy to keep flying after all the close calls he's had. Then why can't you ground him? I can't, but first he has to ask me. That's all he's got to do to be grounded? That's all. And then you can ground him? No, then I cannot ground him. Yeah. There's a catch. A catch? Sure, catch 22. Anyone who wants to get out of combat isn't really crazy, so I can't ground him. Okay, let me see if I got this straight. In order to be grounded, I've got to be crazy. And I must be crazy to keep flying. But if I ask to be grounded, that means I'm not crazy anymore and I have to keep flying. You've got it. That's amazing. That's hilarious. The, the, the context of that is that he, he already had flown 50 missions. Now he's asked to fly 60. And then the next week he's asked to fly 70. And, and he after a while, he feels as though they're not caring about him. They, they really just wanting to submit their record for most, and it's a, it's a long, torturous book. It should have been edited down by 100 pages uh, or more, um, 
but uh, it's worth reading and it's uh, it's a classic. When you read and you say you read about 100 books to write this book, <clears throat> what's the longest you sit while you read? Oh, I can usually read two, 200 pages or so through. And when you're dealing with Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged or Gone with the Wind, you're talking about books that are 1,500 pages in length. Steinbeck's books are long. Um, Joe Heller's book is too long. Um, but Did you have a routine these, during the time you were doing your research? Uh, I have a study in my Colorado home, and I uh, I'd go off there, and it was separate from the house, and I could uh, read at length, and I would make notes, and <coughs> I always mark up books that nobody would want uh, my used books because the, the scribblings all over them. And so I felt an, my obligation in this particular venture was to interview the book and interview the author. And when possible, I went to their archives, like Edward Abbey's archives in Arizona or to the Concord Historical Society in New Hampshire. There's a fellow, I mean, there's an American author named Winston Churchill, and he wrote a book called <coughs> Mr. Crew's Career. It's a great book. And um, it's about a, a Teddy Roosevelt progressive movement in New Hampshire taking on the railroad monopoly of the state legislature. But I tried, I went to Harper Lee's hometown and w spent a day walking around, going to the courthouse. I went to Margaret Mitchell's apartment where she wrote Gone with the Wind. And uh, in John Nichols' case, I had the pl pleasure of having dinner with him in his hometown of Taos, New Mexico. So uh, whenever possible, I kind of tried to do field work and go out and, 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 and visit these places. There's so much you've mentioned I want to catch up with. First, here is Ayn Rand, and to put her into perspective after we watch this. I'm opposed to all forms of control. I am for an absolute, laissez-faire, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I'm for the separation of state and economics, just as we had separation of state and church, which led to peaceful coexistence among different religions after a period of religious wars. So the same applies to economics. If you separate the government from economics, if you do not regulate production and trade, you will have peaceful cooperation and harmony and justice among men. I want to add a quote from you in the book and put it in perspective. Novelists are generally viewed as left of center, you say in your book, but certainly Ayn Rand wasn't. Ayn Rand uh, grew up in, in Russia when communism was developing and her father's pharmacy was nationalized. And she was an immigrant to Los Angeles, was a screenwriter. She is the godmother of the Libertarian Party, of the Tea Party, and she, there's a cult. Uh, you, you can run into Randians and, and people who celebrate John Galt, her main protagonist. She has had an enormous influence uh, on one philosophical element or, or part of American political culture. And it's the one that celebrates <coughs> individualism and freedom and liberty. <coughs> and she, she goes overboard. But she, she was a great storyteller. Her books were turned down by a lot of publishers. I think Fountainhead was turned down by 12 publishers who felt it was too radical or too, too long. <coughs> but um, Ayn Rand lives. She still is a bestseller. And she, uh, half of, of President Trump's cabinet uh, view themselves as influenced by Rand. Paul Ryan used to give out to every, everybody who worked on his staff a copy of Atlas Shrugged and Fountainhead. He doesn't like the fact that she was also anti-religious and she was an atheist, so he kind of has downplayed that. But uh, her theme that we have too much national planning, we're too governmental controlled, is, is, is actually a very important one in the American political dialogue and debate. And so anybody in politics Everybody in politics should read Ayn Rand's work and come to terms with them individually. And, for, and no, nobody can read her work without being inspired by some of her, her prototypes who are rugged individualists, industrialists, who are making things and who are manufacturers. And uh, uh, I don't think President Trump reads, but he, he liked very much the movie, The Fountainhead, which was about a, a builder. <laughs> so he related to that. Did you read both Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged? Yes. And they're both big. Yes. When was she the most visible in our society? Uh, 
probably in the 50s and 60s, I assume. And uh, uh, she lived in New York, and she had a, uh, a coterie of people she influenced, one of whom was Alan Greenspan, who viewed himself as a disciple. He was very unapologetically a disciple of Ayn Rand. And he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, economic advisor to presidents, and a major economic guru. Uh, he toned down some of Randyism, but uh, uh, that was, so the influence during the uh, President Ford's period, for example, where he was very close to President Ford, would be an example of that. You earlier mentioned Edward Abbey. Who is he? Edward Abbey uh, grew up in Appalachia, served in World War II, but he, he is a, a, as libertarian as Ayn Rand, but on behalf of a different kind of philosophy, and that is to preserve the Southwest. And he became a radical environmentalist, uh, almost an anarchist, uh, and he, was, he wanted to preserve the Southwest, which he loved. He spent many summers and worked uh, in the Canyonlands area near Moab, Utah, and he went to school at University of Mexico in Albuquerque. And he, uh, he was uh, prickly. His nickname was Cactus Ed. And uh, he, uh, he was not particularly uh, ecumenical. Uh, in fact, some of his writing is misogynist and racist. Uh, but he was so dedicated, like Rand was to individual freedom, he was so dedicated to a place, the Southwest, and preserving it. He said the American tourists, ha ha the, the American uh, tourists and uh, automobile people have their national park. That's the interstate highways. But he, he didn't want tourists. He was kind of, uh, so he, he, he was a great believer in freedom. Here he is from 72 uh, from a television station KU-TV. Let's at, watch At Abbey, oh yeah, really? At Abbey. Well, I think the major danger to this area is too much economic development, too much road building, too much oil exploration, mineral exploration, development of commercial tourism. I think Southeast Utah is one of the great adventure places left on Earth. And I think we should uh, try to keep it wild and primitive. It really is the property not only of all the American people, but maybe of all the people of the world. Where did you go to see Ed Abbey's material? His archives are at the University of Arizona. He, he taught creative writing there for a while, lived in Tucson off and on, and uh, he, there are files and files and speeches and tapes and all of manuscripts of his in the uh, University of Arizona library that accessible for anybody in the public to visit. Uh, his book, um, The Monkey Wrench Gang, has also given a term to literature, and the monkey wrenching, uh, among other things, means kind of following things up in addition to the mechanical tool. And it's a uh, very entertaining, delightful storytelling, for, but decidedly with a point of view. Uh, he was he was against he was for population control and, uh, and for much more border security. He would he would be supporting Trump's wall today uh, because he didn't want people coming in. And he uh, very iconoclastic, but uh, he. Uh, it's a book that should be read, and young people enjoy reading it, and it's a kind of a cult book, particularly in the West, for young people to read. He wrote a nonfiction piece of work, which is also quite admirable, called Desert Solitaire, which was kind of memoirs of his being a seasonal employee in the national parks uh, in that region from his youth time. In your book, from time to time, we get a glimpse of what you think. Uh, this is just one sentence that I pulled out. They say, as earlier noted, that believing the founders of our country who wiped out Indians, propagated slavery, and gave us the Electoral College were the greatest geniuses in the world is flawed logic at best. Yeah, that's probably influenced uh, from Arthur Schlesinger, who I quote around that same passage. Uh, the major thing I think to realize is that ours is an experiment. Uh, I, I differ with people who uh, cheer on American exceptionalism, and I, I would reframe that to say, ours is an American experiment, and we're uh, and experiments can fail, as all of us who took science courses in high school know. Uh, 
experiments can fail and we continually need to reinvent and reinvigorate and renew uh, the American experiment so that it does um, march on and succeed like Bono was talking about. It's a great, America is an idea and it's an idea that which family you're born into or which zip code you live in shouldn't predetermine the opportunity to succeed in America and that everyone should have a chance to excel and to learn. Uh, th there is an American dream. One of the authors I treat in this book is Horatio Alger. And I, I, I would never have thought about him, but after a while, as my list got bigger, I said, I've got to work on that. Tell I, us about I, I, Horatio Alger. Yeah. Who was he? Horatio Alger grew up in Boston, went to Harvard, and um, he had some problems in a young ministry that he was active in. He, had to, he was kind of kicked out of Boston. Went to New York and, and had kind of a second life, writing about teenagers who were fatherless, kind of orphans, who found success. And his formula was <clears throat> to work hard, to be honest, and to strive, but also to get adopted by a mentor. He, you know, in a sense, he was saying internships and mentorships are crucial to success. And he wrote a hundred very readable short novels. And people like Ronald Reagan and my father and Gerald Ford, and your father probably, grew up reading these books in the 1920s and, and earlier. His heyday was from uh, the Civil War period through, he died about 1900. But uh, he sold maybe 50 million copies. He was the Harry Potter of his generation. And it is, most people misconstrue Horatio Alger to say that anybody can go from rags to Rockefeller. That's actually not what he says. He says if you really work hard and study and become mentored, and uh, you can become a modest success in America. And he knows that not everybody will do this. And he actually rails in his books against bullies and Wall Street sch sch schemas and usury. And he, he actually has a social conscience. He's a Republican, Whiggish uh, background, but and he's writing at the height of the Gilded Age. But he's talking about the American idea, in a way, and I wound up, Brian, going to the New York Public Library and spending a week in the basement where the special collections are, having them to ch cart out these boxes of Rachel Allison Al Al novels that were falling apart. They were literally falling apart right at my, my cubbyhole, and uh, they're not read today, and they're not very much available, but Horatio Alger um, should be read uh, if one is an educated American. What was Beloved by Toni Morrison about? Beloved was a <clears throat> about a woman who escaped from a plantation in Kentucky over the Ohio River and into Cincinnati. And the Fugitive Slave Act was in, in force, so her home, her plantation owners could come after her. And the Fugitive Slave Act allowed local authorities, in fact, <coughs> ordered local authorities to help to recapture a slave. She was so <coughs> appalled at the slavery existence she had had and her whole family had had <coughs> that she starts killing her children in a matricidal kind of way, fearing that that would be better than slavery. But Tony Novel's book, which has won the Nobel Prize as well, and uh, many of her books deserve to be in my collection, but I picked out Beloved because it's perhaps the best known. Um, it's really a book about what we need to remember. And her book is urging African Americans and everyone to remember the tragedies and inhumanities of slavery. Here she is in 2001 talking about why the story that led to Beloved. The story that I had just read a newspaper article about about this woman who said, no, I'm not doing that. This child is mine. Her life is mine. She's my child. I will see how she lives and dies. And of course, it was a crime. And it was a sin. But on the other hand, it was this other gesture. It was complicated. That's a beautiful clip, Brian. Thank you for showing that. Uh, it's shocking to read the early passages in her book. 
but eventually she makes sense of it. She doesn't, she doesn't condone the mother killing the child, but she tries to explain it in the context of what slavery is all about. And her book is the greatest refutation of the plantation fantasies that uh, Margaret Mitchell gave us in Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind has a lot of powerful stories in it, but one of the stories is the misleading story that slaves were happy. And it was like Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. It was just all a pastoral delight. And uh, Toni Morrison, uh, it's one of the great books in American literature. What are a couple of books that didn't make your cut? Well, one novelist who I like and have been reading lately is David Ignatius. Uh, he's written on the CIA and the re his recent book, The Sp uh, Quantum Spy. And uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of what he does. They're, they're, they're thrillers, but he's a very serious reporter, and he knows Washington inside out. And uh, uh, his books are a nice sequel to, to Norman Mailer's book, The Harlot's Ghost, which I talk about, which is a 1950s book, which is about the CIA. <clears throat> Uh, that that would be would be one example. Uh, um, I'm, I've recently done a project on Colorado writers, and uh, there's some delightful Colorado writers. James Michener's Centennial is a sweeping book about the early founding. Uh, Dalton Trumbo, who's famous for, for Hollywood, uh, wrote a book about his hometown in Grand Junction, Colorado, uh, called Eclipse, that I find is a delightful book. But here's Johnny Depp. <laughs> Here's the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, about 47 seconds. Let's watch this. That was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat hook realities that were lying in wait for all those people who took him seriously. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped create. A generation of permanent cripples, veiled seekers, who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending the light at the end of the tunnel. Why Hunter Thompson? Yeah, I met Hunter Thompson a few times in Aspen. We would watch Monday Night Football at the Jerome Hotel Bar uh, <laughs> in the, the mid-1970s. Because our individual homes didn't get uh, that show. Uh, and he, uh, he was a character. That movie, that mo movie uh, was a, a total flop, uh, although Johnny Depp actually had a pretty good performance. But, for, uh, but the movie had too much of just juvenile pranksterism in Las Vegas. It was a Vegas road trip. But the, <clears throat> my students put me on to Hunter Thompson's book. They kept, kept urging me, you've got to read it. And they read it with me. And uh, I, it took me three times to read that book to find that there is, and my publisher encouraged me to <laughs> include that book in it because it's a kind of a cult favorite. Uh, there are political themes in that book. He celebrates freedom and individualism. And he, was, he, he like Ayn Rand and Ed Abbey, and Jack Kerouac were all fierce proponents of freedom and kind of liberation. And uh, there is a, one of the themes in American politics is uh, of uh, rugged individualism and, and uh, kind of liberation, uh, privacy. And Hunter Thompson uh, has many themes. The subtitle of that book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, is a, is a savage trip into the heart of the American soul or the American dream. And uh, he tries to, it's a complicated book because it's, it's the first example, it's a prominent example of gonzo journalism or gonzo fiction where he puts himself in this story and uh, t makes himself central to what's going on. And so it's, it's, it's disarming. It's not like a Steinbeck book or Did other you book. remember, because you, you mentioned this in your book, who, who gave him the name of gonzo journalism? I think an editor at the Boston Globe. I, I don't know who, which one it was, but they... They, they, in South Boston and Boston, the last person standing in a drunk beer party was often referred to as a gonzo uh, for some reason, I don't know. And anyway, he, so this editor described Thompson as gonzo journalism, gonzo writing, and uh, Thompson liked, he liked it and he appropriated it. 
And uh, there were others who put themselves in their narratives earlier. Walt Whitman, for example, and I think Jack Kerouac, among others, talked about themselves and their travels or their po poetry. But I think the, in our time, in the recent generation or two, Hunter Thompson becomes known as the godfather of gonzo writing. We started out talking about your days as a White House fellow in the Johnson White House, and then in this book, you have a novel by Billy Lee. Is it Bramer or Brammer? Brammer, I think. Uh, why did you put that in the book? It's called, uh, let's see if I can find it. Some, some of the way with LBJ. Oh, I, oh that's my, uh, that's my take on title, subtitle, but it's called The Gay Place. And it's uh, using the gay in, a, in the earlier rendition of the word gay of, of, of ruckus, uh, gaiety, and so on. Um, I chose it because political journalists uh, view that as a cult classic. So the, 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 the generation of people like uh, David Broder, who's now passed uh, on, uh, their generation all read that book and loved it because they knew LBJ a little bit or they covered him as who, young who reporters. Who was Billy? Billy, Billy, Billy Grammer. He, he was a writer for the Austin uh, Texas Monthly or something like that. He became a speechwriter for LBJ in the Senate. So from 1957 to 59, he would have been um, a contemporary of Ted Sorensen and Dick Goodwin who were writing speeches for John Kennedy. He was writing for LBJ. Uh, then I think they had a falling out, and he went back to Texas, and he wrote this satirical book about an LBJ who was, uh, but he, he made him governor of Texas. But it turns out to be a book, and this is why a lot of political reporters admire it, it took, turns out to be a book that actually admires politicians and the craft of bargaining and agreement negotiating and so on. So he has this LBJ as governor of Texas, I think it's governor of uh, Arthur Fenstermeister or something like that, and Fenstermaker. And uh, it del delightfully captures Texas politics and uh, legislative politics. It's actually three novels in one. But uh, one of the things, Brian, I tried to do in this book was to have books that talked about politics elsewhere in the country, not just Washington, D.C. novels. I have eight or ten Washington, D.C. or national, but I have a book about politics in New Hampshire, the progressive movement in New Hampshire. I have Hamlin Garland's book about politics in I Iowa. I have uh, Billy, Billy Brahma's book about Texas. Eugene Burdick wrote a book about a campaign for governorship in California called The Ninth Wave. And so I, I tried to, to sell, and of course, Gone with the Wind is a um, historically southern. So I tried to have books representative of the country wherever possible. Here's another one of your quotes in here about politics. Those who are anti-politics or who don't care for politicians are giving up on the grand experiment of the American Republic. Politics is the lifeblood of constitutional democracy, and it is the price we pay for aspiring to achieve a resilient constitutional democracy. Right. I also say, I think in that same passage, maybe, that politi politics to democracy is similar to the experimental method in physics and imagination to poetry and melody to music. Uh, it, you can't have democracy, you can't have a republic, you can't have a constitutional democracy unless you understand that politics and politicians are crucial and they're imperfect. We're all imperfect. We have imperfect institutions, we have an imperfect co constitution, but we have to strive to make our political institutions work and try to encourage good people to go into politics and uh, virtually every novelist that I dealt with some way or other is saying, don't give up on politics. Uh, that's, that's a message that Toni Morrison and, and Harper Lee and uh, Philip Roth and John Steinbeck are saying time and again, don't give up on politics. Did you ever think of running for poli a political job? Yes, and I ran for Congress in 1982, unsuccessfully. And, uh, Who'd I you had, run against? I ran against a congressman named Ken Kramer who was an incumbent Republican, it was the Reagan era, and my district was very conservative, <coughs> but friends persuaded me that you believe in a two-party system, you ought to run, and I was a moderate centrist Democrat and a more conservative. Uh, had I won, it wouldn't have been a good example of democracy because I wouldn't have been representative. But I learned a heck of a lot about myself and my area, and I encourage everybody to run for office uh, once in their life, for some office. Um, uh, it's uh, it, politics is crucial. What's the thing you learned as a White House fellow working around 
you said Bill Moyers. Who else were you working around? Douglas Cater. Douglas Cater, who did a lot of the domestic stuff. Right. Uh, and John Gardner. W what did you learn around them about the presidency that has never changed? Well, I think if you get, if you get to ch work close at hand with members of Congress and, or the president, you learn about the complexity that uh, very rarely can you have sweeping change. Most change is incremental. Most change is uh, getting part of something done. And that compromise, which is a dirty word to many people, is absolutely critically important. You need to get people together who have different points of view and try to work something out. Um, now, in this country, we're facing the issue of, uh, of gun registration and background checks and uh, regulation. We, we, believe in the, we believe in a strong Second Amendment, but we also believe in safe schools. And people have to come together and work on these things. You have a quote that you use in the book uh, by Alan Drury, uh, Advise and Consent. But you say, they're talking about people that come to Washington. They stay 50 years. <laughs> they may love, marry, settle down, build homes, raise families, and die beside the Potomac. But they usually feel, and frequently they will tell you, that they are just here for a little while. That's right. They're really from Indiana or, <laughs> or Massachusetts, and that's true. Uh, this has become a very different town in the, in the past 50 years. Uh, it, uh, it was a place where people were temporary. The novelist Ward Just captures Washington, D.C. in a wonderful novel called Echo House. He's, he was a major writer for the Washington Post and Newsweek when he was younger. But in uh, recent, in the second half of his life, he became one of America's best novelists. Ward Just, I recommend him. The name of this book is Imagining a Great Republic, Political Novels and the Idea of America by Thomas E. Cronin, former president of Whitman College, professor at Colorado College. Thank you so much for joining us. Brian, it was a delight, and thank you. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about Books That Shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.